The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord. And Jesus said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that falls to me. And he divided his living between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took his journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property with loose, in loose living. And when he had spent everything, a great famine arose in that country, and he began to be in want. So he went and joined himself to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have fed on the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? But I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was yet at a distance, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet, and bring the fatted calf and kill it. And let us eat and make merry, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to make merry. Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what this meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Behold, these many years I have served you, and I never, I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me even a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your living with harlots, you killed for him the fatted calf. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to make merry and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, welcome, my brothers and sisters, to the third night of our parish mission, and it's a, an honor to be with you tonight to talk about God's infinite mercy for us. And it's a beautiful reality, the gospel that we, uh, that we just read. If you're familiar with it, it's the parable of the prodigal son. But I think sometimes we hear that parable, and it's a long one. You're standing for quite a while. And we also, we hear it at least twice a year, two times of the year, we hear that parable, the church teaches us that Jesus is uh, God's mercy. God's mercy comes to us through the hearing of that parable and, and also the parables before it. Luke chapter 15 is what a lot of saints call the gospel of mercy within the gospel of Luke. Because we hear about the lost coin, that widow who loses the coin and she sweeps her house trying to find that lost coin and she finally finds it, then she throws a party. Then we hear about the shepherd who, the lost sheep, the sheep that goes astray, and that the shepherd leaves the 99 to find that lost sheep, risking everything just to find that one sheep. But we've got to see how these three parables connect, connect about God's love and mercy for us, for us. But first we have to see who was Jesus speaking to in those, that, that chapter of St. Luke. He was speaking to the scribes and Pharisees, right? The scribes and Pharisees were very literal, and they liked money. They loved money. And so those first two parables make sense. 
One, sheep, right? The, this man lost the sheep, therefore he lost money. This was income. So of course he's going to risk everything. Of course he's going to go out and find this sheep. He's got to. That's lost income. And then of course the widow. A widow usually didn't have much money, of course, because her husband you know, had passed away and he was the primary breadwinner, of course. And so widows didn't have much money. So of course a widow is going to find, she's going to sweep her house and she's going to you know, rejoice when she finds this lost coin. Again, money. It's important. But then Jesus takes it one step further and infuriates the scribes and Pharisees. Because he talks about a father who has two sons. Two sons. And I think we kind of take it for granted, this parable, because it is so long, we tune it out. But let's just go through it just really quick. I won't take too much time about it. But it's a beautiful reality of God's love and mercy for us. So we hear about this man. He's got two sons, right? Two sons. An elder son and a younger son. And one day, the younger son comes to the dad and he tells his father, he says, Dad, I want my inheritance now. I don't want to wait until you pass away. Give me what's coming to me now. And the father gives it to him, right? And so then the son, a couple days later, decides, you know what? I've got my money. I'm going to take the money and run like Eddie Money. Take the money and run. Get out of here. Right? But where does he go? He goes off to a far country, right? Far country means Gentile territory. No longer in the territory of his family. He goes out to the foreign people. And that's where he spends his money. So just let's think about what the scribes and Pharisees are seeing. A, man with, a Jewish man with two sons, the younger son, gets his inheritance. The father gives him the inheritance. So according to Jewish tradition, the younger son is coming to his dad and saying, Dad, you are dead to me. Give me what's coming to me now. And then he takes the Jewish money, the money hard earned by his dad over years of sweat, blood, sweat, and tears, he takes that money and he takes it to a Gentile country. The scribes and Pharisees, again, love money. For you to spend Jewish money in a Gentile territory is unheard of. So this younger son had the audacity to say, Dad, you're dead to me and I'm going to add insult to injury and I'm going to say, I'm taking my money elsewhere. I'm taking my money to California. I'm going to spend my Kentucky money, bourbon money in California. And what does he spend it on? The older son says he spends it on harlots, prostitutes. We'll go even further. He took it to Vegas. <laughs> he took his money to Vegas and spent it all. Spent it all. It was all gone. Loose living, as St. Luke records. So the scribes and Pharisees, their minds are blown right now. I can't believe how the audacity to say this. And then Jesus takes it one step further. He's going to take it a few steps further, but he keeps going. And he says, what does the son do? He spent it all. And there's this great famine and he's in want. He's got nothing left. He spent all his dad's money. He's hit rock bottom, right? So what does he do? He says, I'm going to go be a hired hand, but not just to anybody. He's in Gentile territory. He's going to go and be a worker on somebody's farm, but not anybody. A swine herder. A swine herder. And we don't think anything of it. That's a reputable job now, right? As we said, bacon is great yesterday. I love it. But think about what the Jews thought. What the scribes and Pharisees, who were literalistic with the law. You even get close to a pig and you are ritually unclean. Now this boy, this young man, is going to ten swine. And then... St. Luke records, not only that, he's not only hanging out with the swine, he longs to eat what the pigs are eating. He wants to eat slop. So one, he's already touched the pigs, he's gotten in their vicinity, he's over there tending them, but then he also wants to take that uncleanness and put it into his body. He wants to be unclean outside and inside. The scribes and Pharisees are about to rip their clothes off because they can't believe this is blasphemy. A Jewish son going and hanging out with pigs and then eating the food that the pigs eat? 
You got to be kidding me. And then Jesus comes to the turning point. The son comes to himself and he says, you know what? What in the world am I doing? Why am I hanging out in Vegas? I've got to go back. Even the servants at my dad's house, they eat. They eat and they've got plenty. They're living large. What am I doing here in Vegas down on my luck? I got to go back. I'm going back to my dad. And he comes up with this confession. Dad, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm not worthy to be your son. Don't call me your son. I'm going to be a servant. I want to just serve you for the rest of my life. I'll be happy with that because your servants live life nicely. And so the son gathers all this stuff and he heads on back. And this is where the scribes and Pharisees are waiting. They're waiting to see what is the dad going to do? What is this Jewish father going to do? This dad, when he hears what his son has done with his money. And so they're getting eager. They're rubbing their hands together, ready to see what this dad is going to tear into his son. And what Jesus says is that the son, when the father saw the son a long way off, pause for a second. If you've ever seen any documentaries about the Holy Land or anything, uh, ever been to the Holy Land even, not Holy Land of Kentucky, I mean like Jerusalem and, and, and you know the, 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 the Holy Land where Jesus walked, you know that it's hilly. There's hills and valleys and, and it was hard to see different people, especially because they didn't have binoculars, obviously. So the father sees the son a far way off. That means that the dad went to the highest part of his property and looked for his son. Not only that day, but he must have done this regularly. So every day that his son was away, the dad went to the top of his property and looked, looked for just the glimmer of his son coming back. His dad, the dad was eager for his son to return. And so that one day, that blessed day that he saw his son coming home, maybe with tattered shirt, tattered sandals, even barefoot even, probably didn't have anything. He was probably half clothed, but he sees his son and the dad doesn't wait like the scribes and Pharisees want him to, tapping his foot. Yeah, come on, Brack. I got my arms crossed. Yeah, let's see what, what do you have to say for yourself now? Uh-huh. Yeah, you're coming back groveling. No. What does the dad do? What does the father do? He runs to his son, runs to his son and embraces his son. The dad takes on the son's uncleanness. He takes it upon himself to be unclean because by just touching his son, he can't go to the temple anymore, period. He's made himself unclean and he's got to go make offerings to God to make up for that now. But not only that, not just embracing his son, but he kisses his son. Kisses his son. Are you kidding me? The scribes and Pharisees are out of their mind. How could this dad do this? He has just jeopardized himself for the sake of his son. Wow. And then we hear the son. He comes out with his apology. Dad, I can't believe it. Oh, I've sinned against heaven and before you. Boop. Case closed. Dad doesn't even let him get the second half out. He goes over to the servants and says, go bring me the best robe. Go and get, get the ring that I've been waiting to put back on my son's finger. Go and get sandals. I want to clothe the son with my mantle. I want to give him back his inheritance, giving him that ring. <coughs> And I want to put sandals on his feet because this is my son. He is not a servant. Servants walk around barefoot. This is my son and I put sandals on his feet. I clothe him. I protect him. And I give him back that inheritance. And not only that, you know what? That fatted calf that we've been feeding for years. Let's slaughter it. Let's have a party. This is my son. He was dead and now he's alive again. He was lost and is found. And then Jesus brings in a character who the scribes and Pharisees love. The older brother, right? The older brother. The older brother's out in the field. He's been working hard all day and he starts making his way back in to the house. And all of a sudden he hears music and dancing. Whoa, hey, wait. Nobody told me we're having a party tonight. 
I would have came in earlier. I can't believe. Wait, Dad. Well, Dad, what's going on? Where, where's, where is everybody? And finally, he finds one of the servants, and he says, "Hey, what's going on? Nobody told me about the party. I was going to come in. I, I, I'm just coming in. I'm ready for dinner. What's going on?" And the servant probably said, "You didn't hear? Are you kidding me? Your your brother is back." Your brother, you remember he was gone for years? He's back. And you know what? That cow that you've been taking care of, that calf, you've been feeding, getting up at 5 a.m. every morning? Yeah, it's dead. He's on your plate. He's on the barbecue. We slathered him. We, we, we soaked him in the greatest marinade ever. And man, we're, we're ready to go. Where you been? Man, I've been working. What are you talking about? And the son comes in and he refuses to go in and see his father. He waits for his father to come out. And the father doesn't just say, you know what? Forget him. The father comes out, meets the son where he is and says, what's going on, son? Listen here, dad. I got something to tell you. I can't believe this. I can't believe you have the audacity, the audacity to have a party. To have a party for this, your son? He's not even my brother anymore. I've renounced his brother. I, no, he's not my brother. I renounce. He's a relation of mine. This, your son? He went and spent your money on loose living, on harlots, prostitutes, and you're ready to bring him back? You kidding me? And I've been working here. I've been here all these years, and you haven't even given me anything? Me and my friends want a party. You haven't given me a goat even to, to slaughter and to have a party with my friends. Dad, how could you? This son of yours comes back and you have a party. And me, I've been here working hard. And the dad says, son, everything I have is yours. All you had to do was ask. All you had to do was ask. I would have given you everything. But we've got to party. We've got to make merry and rejoice because your brother... Your brother, truly your brother, he came back. He's back. He was lost and is found. He was dead and is alive again. This is the love and mercy of our God, my brothers and sisters, that even when we are lost, even when we are impure inside and out, even even when we've taken and squandered the Father's inheritance, our salvation by sin, God still is ready to give to give us a second chance, give us a third chance, a millionth chance. God never tires of forgiving us. God's mercy and love endure forever, as the psalmist says. And that's why over the past two nights, we've talked about the dignity of man, the fact that we are loved by God. We are precious, unique, and unrepeatable. And that Christ gave us his church so that there might be a blueprint for holiness that we might come back to God and see there is a plan. God does have a plan for this world and the plan includes my salvation. That's why he gave us the sacraments. And tonight we talk about the sacrament of confession, of reconciliation, reconciling us with the Father. And it's so important for us to see that because this is our response to Christ's love for us. God so loved the world that he sent his son to suffer and die for love of us so that we might, inter- we might receive eternal life. But we've got to make that choice, my brothers and sisters. Because as you see on your news feed on Facebook, as you see on the news, you see it in our own family and friends, this world is broken. We're going through difficulties. You see that day in and day out. And that's why Pope Pius XII, in the first radio address to the United States, he spoke to the bishops of the United States and he said, the greatest sin of this century is the loss of the sense of sin. The fact that people don't realize that sin exists. Sin is what brings gloom into our hearts. Sin is the one that takes us down. We fight against the world, the flesh and the devil. And you see this. I remember there was a a movie that I watched in college over and over and over. It was called The Usual Suspects. It was a movie with Kevin Spacey as the, the villain. And I remember the last line in that movie. Kevin Spacey is speaking to um, the police officer. And he says, the greatest trick the devil ever played 
is convincing the world that he doesn't exist. You ever thought about that? The devil convinces the world that he doesn't exist. Because if the devil and hell don't exist, then there are no consequences. I got nothing. I got nothing to fear. If I don't fear sin, the loss of the love of God, as we said on the first night, then what does this all matter? I can do whatever I want. And it's all about the unholy trinity. Me, myself, and I. That's all that matters. Me, myself, and I. And that's what the world promotes. Get yours. It doesn't matter who you have to step over, who you have to step on. As long as you get what you want, that's all that matters. And this is what we're teaching our children. We've taught our children over and over that they have evolved from monkeys. That they just need to seek pleasure constantly. We've taught them. They evolved from monkeys. Therefore, why are we so surprised when they start acting like monkeys? Why? You've taught them. Hey, you evolved from monkeys. That's your ancestors. Well, if that's my great, 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 great grandfather, I should act like them. So they start throwing their poop around. They start doing stupid stuff, right? And they look to just feed themselves constantly. This is what our world is pushing. Me, myself, and I, whatever you need, get it at all costs. Sin is everywhere, my brothers and sisters, and it permeates our life, especially when we're not focused on Jesus Christ. Without our knowledge and faith in God, we try to resolve the terrible actions of this world by some developmental flaw or psychological illness. Of course, there's psychological illnesses, but people are too quick to say, oh, he's sick. Oh, he's got a problem. Oh, he should be on this drug or that drug. No. If Christ is our center, yes, drugs are good. Of course, they help us. Yes, technology is great. But sometimes we're quick to blame that rather than saying, no, he needs healing. He needs Christ in his life. He needs Christian examples in his family and in his friends so that he might see that he is loved. Yes, there's problems. Yes, there's weaknesses. Yes, people are ill, of course. But this is what has permeated our society. We say, give him a drug. No, give him Christ. Give him Christ. That's what our world needs. People are killing other people. The death of our loved ones. Tragedy afflicts our lives. And yet we say, ah, well, what does it matter? What does it matter? It matters. It matters because those moments are moments that we can turn to Christ rather than walking around like zombies with no purpose. You know, it's fascinating the way our culture promotes zombies now, nowadays. You see them on the movies and on TV, the walking dead, right? But what are zombies, my brothers and sisters? They are, they are apparently human walking around looking like they're living, but they're actually dead on the inside, looking to feast on other people, right? What does this sound like? Walking around apparently alive on the outside, but dead on the inside. Mortal sin. That's what happens when we turn away from God. When mortal sin happens, we are dead on the inside. We're dead. We're apparently alive. It seems like we go about our business fine, but we're dead. We need the light of Christ and we need to be refreshed through confession, of course. How beautiful that is. The reality of God's infinite love for us, that he loves us so much that there is no sin that is too great. Too great. No. Sin matters, yes, but God's mercy matters more. And in the end, our days are filled with drawing near to Christ or walking away from Him. The truth of freedom is that we have the power to act or not to act. But the church asks this question, in this battle against evil and against sin, who could be brave and watchful enough to escape every wound of sin? How can we stand fast in the midst of all of these obstacles and difficulties and weaknesses? 
And that's why the church teaches, if the church has the power to forgive sins, like we said last night, if authority has been given to the apostles and, his, and their successors, then baptism can't be the only means of using those keys to bind and loose that Jesus gave to St. Peter. The church must be able to forgive all penitents their offenses, even if they should sin until the last moment of their lives. That's the importance of the sacraments, the importance of ha- calling on the priest when you're going, going into surgery or when you're on your deathbed, to call on the priest so that you can receive the forgiveness of sins and be anointed to persevere in that last hour. And that's why the devil attacks us, especially in that last hour, because the devil hates the fact that we want to be holy, that we want to go to confession, that we want to live good, upstanding lives in the eyes of God. The devil loves souls who are mediocre, who are lukewarm, because the devil knows those who are in high sanctity, those who try to be holy and live good lives, the devil attacks them because he wants us to live mediocre lives. He wishes to prevent that growth of charity in our hearts because he knows that one fervent soul, one soul that is trying his or her best to love God, keep their eyes on God, and raise their family right, can do far more, exponentially more, than a hundred souls that are just trying to get by in the eyes of God, that are just trying to do the minimum, just coming on Sunday and God The other 167 hours of my life during the week, you got nothing to do with it. But I'll give you an hour on Sunday. What would happen if you did that with your work? If you said, you know what, boss? I'm going to give you an hour. You'd lose that job so quick, right? Because you've got to give your all. You've got to strive for excellence. What would happen, in a better example, what would happen if you told your wife, you know what, honey? I'll give you an hour. I'll give you an hour. That's it. I'll give you an hour. No, 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 no. I love you. I love you so much. Honey, I I would do anything for you, but I'm going to give you an hour. I'm a good person, honey. Don't worry. No, 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 no. No, you got to realize I haven't killed anybody. You know, I tell the occasional lie and stuff. No, 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 no. I'm a good person, honey, but I'm going to give you an hour. No, my brothers and sisters, we've got to give more. Yes, some weeks they are so hectic and so crazy that that is all you can give. But most of the time, most of the time, we can give God more. We can totally be consumed by Him and practice that presence of God that we've been talking about this week. We need to see that we have to rid sin of our lives and we've got to avoid the near occasion of sin. And this may mean turning your TV off after 9 o'clock. Because you know things get racy at the end of the day. You know that you've had a hard day at work and that if you sit in front of the TV, you know you're going to fall. You're going to watch that show that's got some sketchy stuff in it that always leads you to sin. But you know what? It's been a hard day. I just, I can't fight anymore. Well, turn it off. Don't get on Facebook. If it's going to disturb your peace, if you're going to see so many problems and so many difficulties in this world and you're going to start bad-mouthing your sister or your brother-in-law, your mother-in-law because they posted this thing on Facebook, don't look at it. You can turn the, the computer off. Nobody has to say, thou shalt look at Facebook three times a day. <laughs> get rid of the app on your phone if it's a temptation. Get rid of it. We've got to start doing extreme things to rid ourselves of sin because we do extreme things to to fall into sin. We'll go out of our way to sin because we've been tempted, because we've had a hard day and I need to relax. My brothers and sisters, it's high time we see that we have dignity and that sin is disrupting us. If we continue to throw mud up against the walls of this church the first time, it's not going to stick, right? But if I stand here for the next 10 minutes and throw mud up against this wall, more and more is going to stick the more and more I throw at it. My brothers and sisters, your mother and father, when you were growing up, they said, when you came in from playing outside, 
What did they tell you to do? The first thing you had to do at 6 p.m. before you could even come near the table to eat dinner. Go and wash your hands. Or at the end of the night, when you've come in and you've, you've been, had a long day at school, what do mom and dad say? Go take a bath. So go take a shower. I have to take a shower once a month whether I like it or not. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, it's so important because just like that, that shower cleanses us and makes us feel refreshed, we feel better. We feel better when we've taken a shower because we know we're clean. So it is with the confession. So it is with coming to the sacrament of confession. I know it's so hard. I know it takes an act of humility. It takes an act of courage to come in through that door. But you know that when you walk out of that door, You have the certainty of knowing when you walked in, you were full of sin. And when you walk out, it's all wiped away. You get a fresh start, a new beginning. Like we talked about in the homily. You've gotten rid of all of the trash in your life. All the things that stunk up your life. They're gone. Gone. And you are set free. That is so beautiful. And I know Father, Father Hardesty has enjoyed some hockey games and some of you may be hockey fans as well with the Nashville Predators, you know, right down the road. But my brothers and sisters, there's a penalty in hockey. When a hockey player gets into a fight with the other hockey players on the ice, what happens? He has to go to the penalty box. How long does he have to be in the penalty box? Five minutes. Why is it so hard for us to remember And realize, five minutes in the penalty box back there for fighting with your spouse, fighting with your kids, fighting, fighting with the devil. And he won. Time to go to the penalty box for five minutes. Come on out. You're back on the ice ready to play again. It's simple analogies, my brothers and sisters, but we don't realize it. We don't realize it. And especially down here in Kentucky, that Protestant mentality that... Only God forgives my sins. It's just me and God. I totally am united to God. I accept Him as my Lord and Savior and I confess my sins to Him. My brothers and sisters, even Jesus Christ went down to the Jordan and was baptized by a man, St. John, John the Baptist. Jesus humbled Himself before a human being, a human being that He had created, that He knew from the first moment of time that there would be a man, John the Baptist, born of Elizabeth and Zechariah, and that God himself would humble himself before a man to be baptized by him. And all authority, as we said, has been given to Jesus. Of course, God is the only one who forgives sins, but he has entrusted that authority to feeble men, weak men, who are used as instruments. I remember when I was uh, working as a construction worker back in California. I was a contractor's assistant. And I was fascinated when we were doing electric, electric, electrical um, uh, wiring and stuff that when you run electrical wire, you put conduit around it. This little worthless piece of plastic for like $1.25 per, uh, per foot at Home Depot or Lowe's, $1.25. If that conduit doesn't work, then that electricity cannot flow. But that conduit protects the electricity so it gets to the church, to your home. That conduit is protecting that electricity. It's worthless, but it's important. So it is with the priest. So it is with the priest. We're just the conduit of God's power, authority, electricity, if you will to get to you, to wipe away your sins and cleanse you. My brothers and sisters, there was a prophecy given by Paul VI in 1968. It was in the encyclical Humanae Vitae. And whether or not, you know, we've been fighting that battle for, for many years, of course, the fact that God has given us life, given us life, And that every life has dignity. Every single life has dignity. And there have been, within the church and without the church, battles and fights over this. 
But just listen, I want you to hear Pope Paul VI's words. He spoke four things that if we did not combat contraception in 1968, these things would happen. And I call him a prophet only because these things have come true. See if you agree with me. Pope Paul VI said what contraception would do to society. How wide and easy a road would thus be opened to conjugal infidelity and the general lowering of morality doing the good, avoiding evil. And then number two, man, the masculine species, man growing used to the employment of anti-conceptive practice may finally lose respect for the woman and no longer care for her physical and psychological equilibrium. He may come to the point of considering her as a mere instrument of selfish enjoyment and no longer as his respected and beloved companion. And then, number three, the dangerous weapon of contraception would be placed in the hands of public authorities who will not stop from favoring or even imposing upon their people the method of contraception which they judge to be most efficacious, most effective in population control and eugenics. And then number four, contraception would mislead humans into thinking they had unlimited dominion over their own bodies, thus turning the human person into the object of his or her intrusive power. That assumption leads that fertility is an infection to be attacked and controlled, thus connecting it to abortion. My brothers and sisters, Pope Paul VI said this in 1968, that contraception would lead us to use each other as objects, no longer looking at each other as persons who have dignity, who, as St. Saint Saint John Paul II said, the only adequate and proper response to another person is love. Because that person is loved by God, therefore I should love them. And this extends as well to our brothers and sisters who suffer from same-sex attraction. Those who have the tendency towards homosexuality. The church condemns the act of homosexuality just like it condemns the act of fornication, sex outside of marriage. We are called to more, my brothers and sisters, and all of us are called to chastity. It is difficult, but that is the calling. That is the calling. We love the sinner, but hate the sin. That's what we've gotten away from. No longer do we hate sin. No longer do we even say sin exists or the devil exists. We've kicked him out and said, you're just an imaginary figure. My brothers and sisters, we've got to recognize that sin exists and it brings us gloom, brings us despair. But we've got to experience God's love and mercy because sin, gloom, the devil, that's not the end of the story. Christ has set us free and we better start acting like it. Sin matters, yeah, but God's mercy matters more. God can forgive us. God wants to forgive us. And God is always waiting for us to ask for forgiveness. But as we said the first night, he's not going to force himself on us. He is not a predator. He waits patiently for us. He runs to us like the heavenly father in the parable of the prodigal son. He runs to us. But we've got to turn to him. We've got to turn back and start that process, run back to him and meet him, to be embraced by him. And as Pope Francis said in his Twitter feed, again, don't be afraid to ask God for forgiveness. He never tires of forgiving us. God is pure mercy. God is the only one who will not give up on us. And as, he, as Jesus told the apostles in John chapter 20, my peace I give to you, The Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Therefore, whose sins you forgive, they are forgiven. The mercy of God is the only force strong enough to break through the walls of our hearts of pain, anger, fear, resentment. Whatever it might be, the mercy of God is the only thing that can heal us of these spiritual wounds of our life. Of course, we're getting nicks, scrapes, and cuts in this world. Of course, we're weak. St. Paul said, All have fallen short of the glory of God. But St. Paul also said, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Jesus is the one who gives us that that strength, gives us that perseverance. 
Each one of us, my brothers and sisters, doesn't have to settle for staying in the muck and mud of sin. We have that spiritual shower in the sacrament of confession. We can be renewed and refreshed, my brothers and sisters. And our Lord revealed to St. Faustina, he said some things that I think helps us as we enter into the confessional. Jesus spoke to St. Faustina and he said, Tell souls not to place within their own hearts obstacles to my mercy. My mercy works in all those hearts which open their doors to it. Both the sinner as well as the righteous person has need of my mercy. Only God knows the deepest parts of our heart, my brothers and sisters. He looks to our hearts to see that deep conversion. And St. Saint Faustina heard from the words of our Lord, Even if the sins of souls be as dark as night, when the sinner turns to my mercy, he gives me the greatest praise and is the glory of my passion. When a soul praises my goodness, Satan trembles before it and flees to the very bottom of hell. My brothers and sisters, when we say the name of Jesus, there is power in that name because the devil has to flee. When you are fearful, when things are going difficult in your life, cry out to him. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I love you. When we sin, when we fall short of the glory of God, we go to Jesus in the confessional and say, forgive me, Lord. I have sinned. Forgive me. I need your love and mercy now. Wash me clean. Wash me whiter than snow. Even though our sins be as dark as night, even though they be as crimson red, God washes us clean. It frees us from that burden of holding on to our sins. My brothers and sisters, we are weak, of course, but we need Jesus. Even Pope Francis, like I said before, he identified himself as a sinner whom the Lord has looked upon with love. That's the definition of you and I, my brothers and sisters. A sinner who is in need of a savior. A sinner who has been looked upon by the Lord with love. Because the biggest and worst sinners in the history of the church, my brothers and sisters, they became the greatest saints. I'll just point out three real quick. St. Augustine was a lust addict. A lust addict. He was a heretic. He left the Catholic faith. He had a child out of wedlock. But yet he became the doctor of the church. He repented of his sins and his father and mother became saints. His son was brought up in the Catholic faith. How beautiful that is. St. Augustine is a doctor of the church. He had the greatest teachings because he was the greatest sinner. He knew what sin was, therefore he could teach others to avoid it. St. Mary of Egypt. She was a prostitute for 40 years of her life. She slept with everybody. But yet she became a hermitess. She had a conversion, a radical conversion, as she entered, a, in, entered a, a, a church in Jerusalem. God washed her clean, and she went out and became a hermitess out in the desert. And she became one of the greatest saints. Many people would come from all over to ask her of the wisdom, the wisdom of speaking heart to heart to God. Then my favorite, Blessed Bartolo Longo. He was an atheist and a satanic high priest. You think you got problems. This guy was worshiping the devil. And yet the church calls him the greatest apostle of the Holy Rosary, a noble son of Mary. He had a conversion, a conversion because one of his professors led him in college to a priest who heard his confession and blessed Bartolo Longo was set free and is on his way to sainthood. How beautiful, my brothers and sisters, because we recognize a sinner is simply, I mean, a saint is simply a sinner who has turned to God. Knowing that he's a sinner, turned to God and said, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I need Christ in my life, my brothers and sisters. So we turn to God in an intimate way in the sacrament of confession. And as Jesus told St. Faustina, the person of the priest in confession is for me only a screen. Never analyze what sort of priest it is that I am making use of. Again, that worthless instrument. Open your soul in confession as you would to me and I will fill it with my light. 
Jesus fills our heart, my brothers and sisters. I can say it over and over and over again. Jesus says, when you approach the confessional, know this, that I myself am waiting there for you. I am only hidden by the priest, but I myself act in your soul. Here the misery of the soul meets the God of mercy. If their trust is great, there is no limit to my generosity. My brothers and sisters, this is what we have to realize. That when we miss Mass, we miss God. When we call on the name of Jesus in vain, when we say his name and it's no longer hollowed, we scream it out in frustration. When we fall away from God, when we have acts of impurity or use other people as objects, telling lies, whatever it might be, not honoring our father and mother, when we sin, my brothers and sisters, we turn away from God, but the Holy Spirit always moves us towards life, toward conversion, towards repentance, and therefore we abandon ourselves into the loving arms of Jesus. Today, my brothers and sisters, don't let this opportunity pass you by. No longer do we have to be burdened. No longer do we have to carry the weight of sin, resentment, anger, frustration. In our hearts, we can be set free. We want to be cleansed and we come to Jesus. Today is the day of our redemption and the day in which God wants to set us free to truly heal us. The greater the misery of the soul, the greater right that soul has to God's mercy. So if you're a big sinner, join the club. We all are. And that's why we need God and his love and mercy. So today, my brothers and sisters, don't let this opportunity pass you by. Whatever it is that holds you back, if you just need healing, come to confession. Be washed clean. Be set free by the God who loves us. And today, drink deeply from the fount of God's mercy, his love, his forgiveness for you, because he longs to heal you today and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. So the soldiers did this, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing there, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Jesus Christ. Well, welcome, my brothers and sisters, to the fourth night of our parish mission. And as Father Hardesty said, tonight we talk about our Blessed Mother and devotion to her as well as cultivating a a holy life. How do we become saints? How do we imitate our Blessed Mother in our daily life? And we've talked about a lot. We've talked about the human person, each one of us made in God's image and likeness. We talked about the church, the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, how we know truly that Christ founded our church and he's given us those marks, one holy Catholic and apostolic, to show us that. And then last night we talked about our response to Jesus' call. So Jesus loves us. He suffered and died for us. Gave us this church as the blueprint. What is our response? But conversion. The first words of Jesus in Mark's gospel. Repent. Repent first. And believe in the gospel. Believe in the good news that I have come to bring. And we recognize that We have the opportunity for the sacrament of joy, the sacrament of reconciliation with God. When we fall short, when we are weak and sinful, we can run to Jesus in the sacrament of confession because his mercy endures forever. And so tonight we talk about our blessed mother Mary. Why do Catholics devote so much time? Why do so so many Catholics talk about our blessed mother? And what is her role in my life? What's the point? Why do I need Jesus' mother? Well, first off, my brothers and sisters, we've got to put kind of a preface to what we're going to talk about tonight. See, the Catechism teaches us, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, it teaches us 
that we have to understand what the Catholic faith believes about Mary is based on what it believes about Christ. So I'll say that again. What we believe about Mary is based on the belief that we have in Jesus Christ. And then what it teaches about Mary, what the Catholic Church teaches about Mary, it illumines in turn the faith that we have, the church's faith in Christ. So that old adage that St. Louis-Marie de Montfort, that beautiful, beautiful phrase that St. John Paul II took as his Episcopal motto, totus tuus Mariae, I am totally yours, Mary, because I go to Jesus through Mary. And so we've got to keep that as the preface, to Jesus through Mary, because what we believe about Mary is based on the belief in Jesus and what the church teaches about Mary, it sheds light on our belief in Jesus. So let's think about that just for a second. Because as St. Bonaventure said, God could make a greater world, but he cannot make a more perfect mother than the mother of God. See, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, he said that Mary, our blessed mother Mary, she is the dream of God. And we believe this. Because we experienced it in our own life. When you were young, when our young people, they dream about what their spouse would be like. I remember when I was seven and I had my first girlfriend. She was the perfect girlfriend. Perfect, right? She was blonde. She was an awesome cook. She was learning from her mom. I always dreamed about when I would turn 16, I would buy that 1968 Camaro SS and I would drive up to her and I'd say, baby, 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 I want you to be with me for the rest of my life. And so in turn, our young people, our, the, the young girls, they dream, what is our, my husband going to be like? Is he going to be brown hair, black hair? What color eyes is he going to have? Where am I going to meet him? Maybe I'll meet him in high school. No, no, no. Maybe in college. Or maybe we'll meet him meet at work. I'll be working, he'll be working, and we'll happen to have lunch together. I'll run into him at Starbucks or something. I don't know. Where am I going to meet him? How tall is he going to be? Is he going to be an athlete? No, he's probably going to be a professor because we're going to have really smart children. And he's going to be totally handsome because we're only going to have beautiful children. <laughs> you dream about these people. You dream about what your spouse is going to look like, what they're going to be like even before... They come into, be out, into reality, come into being, into your life. And how beautiful it is that this is the way that our human mind works and that even God, we participate in that in God because God knew from all time that you all would be here on December 3rd at 7 p.m. You would be here. He knew that from all time. At the beginning of creation, he knew today, December 3rd, 2014, you all would be here. I would be preaching. And therefore, on the moment of creation, he knew that he would create a perfect vessel, our Blessed Mother Mary, by which Jesus would come into the world and which we anticipate and rejoice as we get close to Christmas, right? Right? That's Advent, the time of preparation for the coming of Jesus. This is what we're going to meditate upon this whole, this whole month of December. And we're also going to meditate upon our Blessed Mother Mary today. And how beautiful that is. And so we understand this dream of God. We understand our Blessed Mother Mary in the context of love. If God is love, then he loved the world so much that he sent his son, as St. Paul said, through Mary, a chosen virgin. He fulfilled his promise to Israel. Behold, behold, this will be your sign, Isaiah. A virgin shall give birth to a son and his name shall be Emmanuel. God is with us. And as St. Luke records, where we get a lot of our information about our blessed mother Mary, St. Luke says, that there was a woman named Mary betrothed to a man named Joseph who lived in the town of Galilee, the town of Nazareth. And Mary was taken into the home of Joseph and that is where the domestic church, where God resided, where God lived for 30 years of his life, 
But before we get to the 30 years of Jesus in that hidden life with his blessed mother, we've got to think about this just for a second. Who is St. Luke? Who is this source that we're basing our belief in our blessed mother on? Who is he? He wasn't called by Jesus. We know that St. Luke, he was, an, he was a disciple of St. Paul. St. Paul had called Luke. He says, give my greetings to Mark and to Luke, Luke the physician. Luke is with me. So Luke was with St. Paul, but St. Luke never met Jesus. He was with St. Paul. Jesus had already passed away. St. Luke may have met Peter and John and James and some of the apostles, but Luke never set eyes on Jesus. But what we have to understand is that where did St. Luke get his information then? St. Luke, he's the one that wrote the Gospel of Luke, right? We've been reading it throughout this week. But he also wrote the Acts of the Apostles. He gives us the testimony of the church after Jesus has resurrected and ascended to his Father. What did these apostles do? St. Luke records all of this. And he sends it as a letter to Theophilus, Theophilus, God Uh, the friend of God in Greek, Theo, God, Philus, which is the, the friend of God. And how beautiful it is that each one of us is the friend of God. Each one of us is hearing these words. But if you do a thought experiment, if, if St. Luke is not a disciple, is a disciple of St. Paul and did not know Jesus, maybe he knew the apostles. Where did he get his information? Especially about those first two chapters, about the Annunciation, the Visitation, the birth of Jesus, the presentation in the temple, the finding in the temple. Luke, how did you know all of this? St. Paul wasn't there. St. Peter wasn't there. He got it from our Blessed Mother Mary. See, Pope Benedict XVI in his book, Jesus of Nazareth, the Infancy Narratives, that third book, which is actually the precursor to the other books, talks about Jesus in his infancy, those 30 years of hidden life. We don't know much. That's why the book's very small. But he says, St. Luke is amazing because he would have sat at the feet of Mary to hear all about this. Because in Luke's gospel, we hear about what happened to Mary. Mary, when the angel Gabriel appeared to her, what did the angel Gabriel say? How did she feel? What did she respond What did the angel respond to that response? And then she said, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. May it be done unto me according to your word. Then she runs in haste to go see St. Elizabeth, who was with child six months. St. Luke records she stays with Elizabeth for three full months. What does Elizabeth say when she first sees Mary? Not even sees her, but hears Mary's greeting. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. I am not worthy that the mother of my Lord should come to me. And what did Mary respond? Her Magnificat, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. St. Luke wasn't there. He's got to hear it from the Blessed Mother. He's got to go to the primary source. As a good physician, he's got to know every detail. And he's hungry for that information. Hunger, hungry for for that desire for God. From the words of our Blessed Mother Mary. So hypothetically, we can think about it in this way. St. Luke's hanging out with St. Paul. And he's asking St. Paul all of these questions. Because as a good doctor, he wants to diagnose the problems. And where is the solution? Jesus Christ, therefore, how did Jesus Christ come to us? He wants to know everything. And St. Paul probably went, okay, here's everything that I know. But I still never saw him. I only heard his voice. He called out to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He said, why don't you go see Cephas? So St. Luke goes and sees Cephas and St. John and St. James. He goes and hangs out with them. And they probably told him all about what Jesus did. But then they probably told St. Luke, listen, we were only with him for three years. Three years, three measly years. That's like over a thousand days. Why don't you go see his mom? She lives on First Street. She's the second house right next to the synagogue. Actually, St. John can take, take you because she's living with him. Because at the cross, she was given to him. See, I don't know about that. I'm Peter. I don't know about that. I wasn't at the cross. I ran away. I denied him. But St. John was there. 
And so St. Luke would have went and saw our Blessed Mother, and she would have given him these details. What was it like at the Annunciation? What was it like to lose Jesus for three days? You think you've got problems when your kid runs away and hides in the coat rack in Target or at, at Walmart or something. They lost God for three days. St. Joseph was probably flipping out. He didn't know what was going on. He lost. He was entrusted with the mother of God and God himself, and he had lost him. What was it like? What was it like to see Jesus, find him in the temple? He's sitting with the doctors teaching them what's going on. I know we say it over and over, but sometimes we miss this. We miss the simplicity of the Gospels, the fact that St. Luke would have give, gotten this information from the, our Blessed Mother's mouth, from her, her, her heart. Because as he records all of these things, the things that happened in Jesus' life, she pondered them in it, her heart over and over. The monastic fathers would call that rumination. Rumination means to chew on something over and over and over and over again. Just like we chew on steak over and over to get every single taste, but every single seasoning and flavor out of it. We chew on it and enjoy it. Our Blessed Mother would have chewed on, quote unquote, she would have ruminated over the mysteries of Jesus. Why? Because she spent 30 years with Jesus. The apostles only got three years. She spent 30 years with him. Nine months in his, in, in, he was in her womb. It wasn't some miraculous thing where Jesus presto changeo, he's a 33-year-old man, and I'm going to die for your salvation. No. He went through stages. He grew in wisdom and knowledge. Our Blessed Mother cooked dinner for Jesus, cleaned up after Jesus and St. Joseph, changed Jesus' diapers. These are things that we kind of overlook, but at the same time, she saw all this, and she wanted to communicate it to the world and knew that St. Luke was writing this beautiful letter. Therefore, she's got to talk about these different things, these mysteries of our faith. So how beautiful it is, my brothers and sisters, that we can have the surety knowing that these words are accurate and they come from the, the mouth of our Blessed Mother. But why is that important? Why is it important? If you cheated and you looked at my Holy Rosary DVD, bought one and took it home with you, you know that this is the reason why we pray the Holy Rosary, because we participate in our Blessed Mother as she chews on these mysteries. She meditates upon these mysteries, pondering them in her heart. That's what we do at the Holy Rosary, because you are uniting heaven and earth together when you pray the Holy Rosary. Now, our Protestant brothers and sisters say, what are you doing? Jesus tells us strictly, don't babble like the pagans. Don't say things, prayers, over and over and over and over again. Well, my brothers and sisters, there's no better prayer than the Holy Rosary, right? One, you start off with the Our Father, the prayer Jesus taught us. Case closed. They asked him, how do we pray? He said, pray like this, period. Our Father who art in heaven. Right? Our Protestant brothers and sisters see that. But then they say, what about this Hail Mary? What's so big about her? Well, my brothers and sisters, you're uniting heaven and earth in that just that one little prayer. See, you're taking the words of the angel Gabriel. What's an angel? A messenger of God. Given a message from God to this person. Angels always had messages to give to people. We saw it with Abraham. We saw it with uh, uh, Tobit. We saw it with, with the different uh, Raphael with Tobit and, and all the different um, manifestations of angels in the Old Testament. They always had a message. The greatest of all messages, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. So we're taking the words of God through an angel to this woman. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Then we say the words inspired by the Holy Spirit of St. Elizabeth. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. So you take heaven, and you take earth, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and unite them. Unite them how? In the name of Jesus, the name of our salvation. So maybe you got your Protestant brothers and sisters on the hook right now. But then they say, what about that second half? 
Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Well, my brothers and sisters, Holy Mary, why do we call her holy? Because she's the mother of God. And why would she want to pray for us? Pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Why? Because if you've ever fallen off of a ship or you've gone water skiing or something on, on, on the lake, you know that when you fall out of the boat, you're going to cry out. If they don't see you, if the roar of the engine is too loud and the driver doesn't see you, are you just going to sit there in the water and say, oh, help. Oh, I guess they didn't see me. I'm sure they'll come back at some point. No, you're going to scream out, hey, wait a second. Hello, Bob, get over here. I'm in the water. I fell down. Hello, help, 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 help. And you keep saying it till your voice goes hoarse. Why do we pray? Because we are sinners. All have fallen short of the glory of God. We need God's help. And who better to turn to than the Blessed Mother, the Mother of God. Jesus was obedient to her for 30 years. Three years of his life, the entirety of his life, 30 years he was in silence, silent obedience to our Blessed Mother. Archbishop Fulton Sheen always said, if Jesus loved her that much, who am I to say I can't love her that much? He spent 30 years with her. That's incredible. God himself humbled and obedient before a woman, a woman chosen by God, to be his mother. So pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Why at the hour of our death? Because our blessed mother Mary was there at the cross, at the death of her son, at the murder of God. She was there. And she was there at the death of her spouse, St. Joseph. When he passed on from this earth, she was there along with Jesus at that moment. So again, uniting heaven and earth in prayer. This is the role of our Blessed Mother Mary now. She is united to us in prayer. So our Protestant brothers and sisters, they don't see that. The rosary is the most scriptural prayer you can pray. And all we're doing when we meditate upon the mysteries, when we say those mysteries, the first glorious mystery, the resurrection, You're chewing on that resurrection. You're thinking about it, pouring over it in your heart, pondering it. What was it like to be there at the resurrection, at the empty tomb? Each Hail Mary is one step closer to seeing, pondering, to meditating upon that. One of our priests, Father Wade, he says, don't just get your rosary in, get into your rosary. St. Teresa of Avila said it would be better for you to pray one Hail Mary meditating upon the mystery of Jesus than to pray a thousand rosaries with an empty mind. It's okay if you can only get one decade in. It's okay if you can only get three Hail Marys in. If you are meditating upon those mysteries, it is fruitful. You are bearing fruit for the Lord. It is beautiful. But we've got to move on if you want more. The DVDs in the back. Little plug. But my brothers and sisters, we are uniting heaven and earth because that's what God did. As Blessed Mother Teresa of Calcutta said, God does not choose the qualified. He qualifies the ones he chooses. That's what he did with our Blessed Mother Mary. She was 14, 15, 16 years old, something around there. And she was chosen by God. She didn't say, look at me. I'm immaculately conceived. God should choose me to bring about the Savior. Bring the Messiah, Lord. Come on, bring it down. No, she said, no, I'm just the handmaid of the Lord. I just, I just want to love the Lord. But God chooses her. He qualifies the one he chooses. And that's why St. Paul tells us, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons of God. God brought about his divine plan through this woman, Mary, and how beautiful it is. But sometimes our Protestant brothers and sisters, and even our Catholic brothers and sisters, wonder about that line in St. Matthew's Gospel where it says the brothers and sisters of Jesus come to him, his mother and his brothers and sisters are outside. 
What does this mean? What does this mean? Because we truly believe that Mary only had one son, her only begotten son, Jesus. What does it mean with brothers and sisters? You've heard it said, of course, that these are Jesus' cousins, of course. But we've got to see, wait a second, what about the brothers and sisters? We see that James and John, the ones whom are pointed out, they're the children of the other Mary. In Matthew 27, 56, their same names are pointed out as the sons of another Mary. This Mary was a follower, but she was very distinct from the mother of God. Brothers and sisters, of course, is cousins. Jesus is Mary's only son. But recognizing the gospel that we said today, that gospel from St. John that said from the cross, Jesus looked at his mother and said, woman, behold your son. And then he looked at the disciple and he said, behold your mother. Jesus is the only begotten of Mary, but Mary has taken us all under her mantle. If you've ever seen little kids, like let's say two to five years old, a lot of times when something scares them, where do they run to? Run to mom, right? And they run underneath mom's dress or behind her legs or whatever. There's a, um, there's a depiction of our blessed mother, Our Lady of Mercy, and it shows her. It shows her with this humongous mantle and all mankind under that mantle. Because she is the mother of mercy, therefore she shelters all of those who fly to her protection. There's an ancient prayer from the third, uh, second, uh, fourth century, excuse me, 356 AD. It says, we fly to thy patronage, O holy mother of God. What is a patronage? What is a patronage? It was something that was taken into battle. It was taken into battle. In the midst of battle, they would run, run towards this flag, this flag that, depict, that, 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 that would gather the troops, muster of the troops, and send them out. Send them out to battle more. We fly to her patronage. We fly in the midst of battle to our Blessed Mother Mary, who sends us to Jesus. She always points us to Jesus. Just like at the wedding feast of Cana, the servants come to her. She recognizes this, this, that they have no wine. And of course, rather than saying, oh, well, that stinks. I wish they had some more wine. She goes to her son and says, Jesus, they have no wine. And Jesus says, what's this to me and you? What, my hour has not, not, no, the hour has not come, mom. And she, in faith, goes over to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you. She leaves it to the will of God, will of Jesus Christ. She abandons herself. If he tells you, forget about it, then forget about it. If he tells you, go fill the stone water jars like he does, go fill them. And what do they do? They fill them to the brim. They want to fulfill the request of the Lord to its fullness. And that's when the most beautiful wine ever came out. Jesus turned water into wine through the intercession of our Blessed Mother Mary. And so we could talk about this all day long, my brothers and sisters, because there are so many mysteries in the Holy Gospels about our Blessed Mother. But again, remember that preface. What the church teaches about Mary is based on the belief in Jesus. It's all about Jesus. We just look at him through our Blessed Mother and what we believe about Mary what the church teaches about Mary, it illumines Christ. The ancient fathers in the early church, they used to call Jesus the Son of God. S-U-N, right? The Son. Because the Son can never burn out. We know, obviously, through scientific research and everything, that the Son eventually will burn out. But truly, the Son is everlasting. Because we're not, I'm not going to see it. It's like millions of years away. But what did they call our Blessed Mother Mary? The moon. Why? Because all the moon does is reflect the sun's rays. That's it. That's it. Like we talked about the first night. All we are are mirrors of God. We can just reflect God into this world. Well, she was the most perfect reflection. No flaws in her. She is the blameless one. 
and her faith in God was unadulterated. She never doubted. She knew that God would fulfill his promises and that if he said that she would be with child through the, through the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit would overshadow her. She put her trust in God saying, Behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. And she stood at that cross at the death of her son. He was innocent. She stood at that cross knowing that that is not the end. That God can bring about a greater good from an apparent evil at the teaching of the church. What greater evil could there be than the murder of God? And yet our Blessed Mother stood there with St. John and Mary Magdalene and the other women, and they looked upon him whom they had pierced, and they believed. They gave that assent of faith that God does bring a greater good. So my brothers and sisters, this brings me to part of my story. I grew up as a Catholic boy, I was an altar server. I, I helped Father constantly. I was around the church constantly. I was homeschooled through high school, which meant that all Father had to do was call up my house and I would be there at the funerals, at the weddings, at the baptisms, at any and odd mass. During the triduum, I probably served more triduums than I can even remember. God is the one who sent me sent me as an altar server at the service of Father. And this was the conversation that usually happened every single Saturday morning without fail. Ring, ring. Hello? Oh, uh, oh, hi, Father. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, no, we're not doing anything. No, 11 o'clock? Oh, oh, okay, yeah. Andy will be there, no problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, 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 Father. God bless you too. No, 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 it's no problem. He wasn't doing anything anyways. Okay, okay, yeah, see you at 11. Bye. And I'm standing behind my mom as she has her cordless telephone, and I'm going, oh, are you serious? It's Saturday. You know college football's on. And so I was there. I was there at everything that happened at church. And my dad was a Knight of Columbus. My mom was part of the Altar and Rosary Society. She did the Curcio movement. She did all these different things. And me and my brothers were the altar servers constantly. So I grew up around the faith, but I never engaged my faith. I was there, but I was never there. I did it because that's what was asked of me. But I never engaged my faith. I was the president of my youth group. But yet I was never really engaging my faith. And so because so many different uh, old ladies and, and, and old men, they had, a, they had asked me constantly, anytime that you're up on the altar, anytime you serve Mass, they're going to ask you this question, right? You should be a priest. You should think about becoming a priest. I offered my holy hour today so that you'd become a priest. You'd look good in a cassock. You could look good as a priest. You really should become a priest. You should think about becoming a priest. It's really important that you become a priest. You know the church is in a vocation crisis. You really need to become a priest. I think you should be a priest. I prayed my rosary today so that you would be a priest. So after, you know, hearing this thousands of times, when I graduated high school, I thought, well, I'll give it a shot. So I went to Franciscan University of Steubenville and I joined the pre-theologate program, the pre-seminary program. And after one year, because of bad behavior, the priest at my exit interview for my freshman year, he looked at me and he said, Andy, you will never become a priest and I'm not even sure that you love God. And what would be your response? I know a lot of us would say, how dare you, Father? How dare you tell me that I'm never going to be a priest? You know what? That's motivation. I'm going to be a priest and I'm going to be the best darn priest that you'll ever see. What was my response? Thanks, Father. You got it off my conscience. It's on your head. On Judgment Day, if I was supposed to be a priest, you told me no. Good luck. God bless. See you on Judgment Day. And I ran. I ran away. And so I immersed myself in anything that had to do with girls. I went to church because girls were there. I went to adoration because girls were there. I went to dances because girls were there. I went and became the intramural basketball, flag football, ultimate frisbee, and volleyball coach in the intramural in the, amongst the college students. I took on a team. I, I played myself. 
I did anything and everything that had to do with girls. I would hang out in the J.C. Williams Center in the plaza in the middle of the campus, just hanging out, having the lunch, doing whatever, because girls would pass by. And, you know, I thought, well, you know, if I hang out enough, it's kind of like by osmosis. If I hang out enough, one of them might find me attractive and maybe I might get a girlfriend. And what do you know? I did. And ironically, because this is so weird, she was one of my players on my, ba- on my, on my teams. Somehow, she seemed to be always on my, the team that I was coaching. It's, it's funny the way that they volunteer for that, you know. And so we fell in love, and I was head over heels with my girlfriend, and I was ready to marry her by the end of my sophomore year. I went home. She lived in Ohio. I lived in California. This was a problem. Therefore, I worked three jobs and an internship at the newspaper so that I would be with my girlfriend for the rest of my life. I would move to Ohio. I would be with her, and we would live happily ever after. One hitch in, the, in my little plan. My mom said, do you think you're going to marry her? I said, absolutely. She said, you need to pray about it. I said, pray about it? What do you mean pray about it? She said, here's what you're going to do. You're going to pray a, you're going to pray a novena to St. Therese, the little flower. And this is a great novena. I said, okay, well, tell me how great it is. You're going to get a sign, a sign from God. If you're supposed to be with her, but if you're not, you'll get no rose. See, the novena, you pray to God that God will show you, manifest himself to you through St. Therese, who is the little flower. And what St. Therese said, I will spend my heaven doing good on earth. I will spend my heaven showering roses on earth. And so the church takes that. And in the novena, you pray that St. Therese will send you a rose if it is a yes to your question and no rose if it is a no to your question. So a rose if it's a yes, no rose if it's a no. So I said, this is the novena for me. Great. You got to pray it for nine days. Perfect. So on the ninth day of this novena, I began praying, praying this novena. And on the ninth day, I was working as a busboy for a catering company. And it was four o'clock in the morning and we had just finished this huge wedding. It was crazy. So many things going on. And I was pulling out of the driveway at this local winery. And all of a sudden, this bridesmaid comes flying out of the darkness and she hits my car. I was only going like two miles an hour because I was worried about that. But she bumps into my car and she's carrying three centerpieces from this wedding. And I'm like, what the heck is this? This woman is crazy. She is off her rocker. She is drunk as sin. I don't know what's going on. This is crazy. And she, I I rolled down my window. I said, what are you doing, ma'am? And she said, Oh, you need to give these to, 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 to your mom. What? She said, yeah, these are, these are yours. You should take them. And I said, whatever. Throw them in the bed of my truck. I'm out of here. Don't you know it's 4 o'clock in the morning? I just want to go to bed, please. And so she threw them in the back of my truck, and I took off. I went down the highway, got back home, wrote a little post-it note to mom. Hi, mom. Love you. Here's some flowers for you. See you in the morning. And I went to bed. But this was the ninth day of the novena. I had prayed the ninth day prayer at midnight on my lunch break. And so when I woke up the next morning, being in a fog, I woke up, said hi to mom. Mom's at the table, the kitchen table where I placed those roses. Dad is at the, at the um, um, stove. He's cooking breakfast for the family. And all I could think was, mom's crying. Dad's cooking. Oh no, what did dad do now? <laughs> and so my, I, I say, hi mom, hi dad, love you, good morning. And my mom, through her sobs, she says, these are beautiful roses, I can't believe this. Where did you find these? I said, oh, they gave it to me at the wedding last night, they're beautiful. Oh yeah, yeah, but have you done that novena? <clears throat> And I said, yeah, today's the ninth day. She said, these are roses, don't you see? So what's the answer? And all of a sudden the fog lifted and I looked up over the, over the couch and I looked and there were three dozen roses. But my brothers and sisters, because I was a little pagan, I said, I want a rose no matter what. So I prayed, what's the easiest rose that I can get? A red rose, right? So a red rose, if it's yes, if I'm supposed to be with my girlfriend, I will get a red rose. But I said, St. Therese, send me any other color rose if it's a no. 
Because I just want to get a rose. I don't want to be in confusion for the rest of my life. Did I get a rose? Did I not get a rose? So I said, red for yes, any other color rose for no. My brothers and sisters, when I looked over that couch, I saw every other color rose except for red. I saw white, orange, tiger lily, pink, blue, purple, dipped roses that were colors that I don't even know where they came from. But zero red roses. And I don't know why anyone's surprised at that. I'm standing up here as a priest. You know I'm not married to that girl. So, <laughs> But at the same time, my brothers and sisters, I looked at my mom and I said, it's a no. And she started crying and my dad started crying and I started crying. And all of a sudden my brothers woke up, my two younger brothers, they woke up and they said, okay, who died? <laughs> But my brothers and sisters, and especially the sisters in the audience, what would you think if your boyfriend called you up the day after Mother's Day and said, I just got a sign from God that we're not supposed to be together? And remember, I'm from California. So my girlfriend said, what did you smoke last night? But I was heartbroken. My girlfriend was heartbroken. I tried to explain it to her. I tried to explain how evil and mean this God was that he had taken us away from each other, but she wouldn't have it. And when I went back to school, I had no friends. All my friends abandoned me because at a Catholic college, you break a girl's heart. You're Dr. Evil now. You can't do anything right. And so I ran away from God because he had taken away everything. He had taken away my girlfriend the love of my life, my everything. And my plan was shattered. And so I ran. I immersed myself in anything and everything that had to do with college. Anything and everything that I had heard rumors about on campus. I wanted to do it. But I ran and ran. And during my senior year, my best friend, my best friend in college, my roommate for two years, I got a phone call at four o'clock in the morning after partying all night I got a phone call from his mom from California. She said she was boarding a plane because Gabe had overdosed on Oxycontin and cocaine. And I said, what? Are you serious? There, no, that can't, I was at the party. I can't, there, there was no drugs there. She said, well, he's in the intensive care unit and he's in the psychiatric ward. And my, brother, my, my best friend's mother flew to Pittsburgh, Cal- Pittsburgh Pennsylvania And she wasn't able to see her son because of HIPAA regulations. He couldn't, he wasn't of sound mind to write and write his signature to give her permission to come to his room. So he was in the psychiatric ward of the hospital for at least two weeks without his mom ever being able to see him because he wasn't of sound mind. He was detoxing and they were pumping his stomach and he was coming down off of all these drugs that he had taken, this cornucopia of drugs. Thank God. My best friend is now married, three kids, beautiful wife and family, good Catholic guy, amazing. But it scared me. It scared me and I called my mom and I said, Gabe's in the hospital, mom, I don't know what's going on. And she said, have you prayed for him? I said, prayed for him? What are you talking about? He's in the psychiatric ward, his mom's on the plane and you're asking me to pray for him? You think that's going to do anything? My mom said, please pray. Pray a Hail Mary for him. Go to the chapel right now and pray for him. She said, if you love me, you'll go and pray for him. Okay, good. Okay, fine. If I love you, great. So I go and pray for him. Well, Gabe got worse. This was the second second and third day. And he went into a coma because the drugs had taken a toll on his brain. And he slipped in and out of a coma. And I said, see what your prayers did? How dare you tell me to pray for him? My mom said, you should pray more. She said, go into the chapel today and pray three Hail Marys for him. And I said, okay, fine. So I went went and prayed and I prayed three Hail Marys for the next couple days. And finally Gabe got better. And so my mom said, here's what you're going to do. You're going to pray a decade of the rosary. Then the next time I talk to my mom, you're going to pray two. You're going to pray three. You're going to pray three, uh, four decades of the rosary, five decades of the rosary. And I don't know if anybody's ever told you, but five decades of the rosary equals a full rosary. So I started praying the rosary again, praying rosary for Gabe, for his recovery. And of course, he got better, how beautiful it is, because so many people were praying for him, it wasn't just me. But I started praying the rosary, and I started carrying the rosary with me, because I thought, well, if it's powerful enough to take this guy out of a coma, it's powerful enough for me to carry on me. 
So I started praying and I was always holding it. Anytime I got scared, I held the rosary. Anytime I grabbed my, my pocket, I, 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 I you know, was holding the hand of Our Lady. But I really wasn't engaging my faith until that senior year when I got that scare. And finally I graduated. And here's where it gets real good. Because I graduated with a journalism degree and I started working as a sports journalist in California. And I was working. I was working my tail off, busting my butt to go out and do my job. But I was getting paid pennies on the dollar because I was a junior reporter. I was new to the industry and they were trying to rough me up a bit. And so I was driving 100 miles every single day. Gas was at $4.25 an hour and I was getting paid $8 an hour. The people at the fast food chains were getting more than me. And so I was getting frustrated. I totally was so upset at God because he had given me this deadbeat job. He had given me this terrible ed- editor. And I was just, I, I was dying. I didn't know what to do. I was still living with my parents. I didn't have any money to my name. I was, had to pay my student loans. This was hell, obviously. First world, first world, world problems. But I was dying. And I said, God, you've got to do something now or else. I can't do this anymore. And I happened to be at Mass when I prayed that prayer. God, you've got to do something. And the priest got up at that Mass and he said, Today Jesus tells us, take up your cross and follow me. And there are men and women in this world who are running from their vocation in life. I said, oh, well maybe I'm supposed to work for ESPN. Maybe I have to move to Connecticut in New York City because I'm supposed to work for Sports Illustrated, right? And so I went to work that day and I totally messed up. I totally messed up. I didn't get the story in in time. I messed up the layout of the newspaper. I moved advertisements inadvertently. And when, they were, when it was uh, uh, printed, they were all askew. They were all crooked and everything. And the advertisers were all over the newspaper because I had messed it all up. And so I went to Mass. I went to confession first and I went to Mass. And I said, Lord, I can't do this anymore. This job stinks. Get me out of here. You've got to do something now or else. I don't know what I'm going to do. And the priest got up that day and he said, Today is a continuation of yesterday's gospel. Jesus tells us, take up, uh, leave everything, take up your cross and follow me. And there are men and women in this world, in the state of California, and in this church right now, who are running from their vocation to the priesthood and religious life. Ouch. I said, no, Lord, it can't be. How in the world? No, you, I got this out of my system. There's no way. No, Lord, I can't do it. And it just kept ringing in my head, running, running, running from their vocation. And I said, okay, Lord, but you've got to do it. I don't want to, I, I, I can't do it. I'm not able to do it. I'm not strong enough. And so I looked into the priesthood. And you know what? I was 22 years old. I had my college degree. I was in pretty good health. And nobody called me back. I emailed looked into dioceses, looked into religious communities. I even, you know, (laughs) sent emails, sent letters of application, everything. Nobody responded. Not a phone call, not a text message, not an email, nothing. And I was like, no, there's no way. How could you get me on this hook? And now nobody's going to respond. Vocation crisis, my foot. What? No way. Somebody, nobody's going to talk to me. And so I called up one of my friends, one of my chaperones that I had gone to World Youth Day with. And I said, Janine, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what's going on. I think I'm called to the priesthood. And she said, yeah. I said, yeah, but nobody's calling me back. I don't know what to do. She said, well, you need to call my cousin. He's the vocation director at this little community in Kentucky called the Fathers of Mercy. They travel throughout the United States, preaching parish missions and retreats, and their only uh, house in the world is in Bowling Green, Kentucky. I said, whoa, Janine, hold on just for a second here. I said, wait, wait, Uh, you're telling me I got to call your cousin, who's the vocation director of this little community. I said, one, I hate traveling. Two, I'm deathly afraid of speaking in public. My knees knock every single time. And three, I don't know where on God's green earth Kentucky is on a map. (laughs) Anything, anything east of Nevada, that's like no man's land. I don't know where, where are these people? Obviously, I knew where University of Kentucky was. I'm a good sports fan. I've got to know where University of Kentucky is. 
But Bowling Green? I mean, who? Bowling Green? Then she told me that's where the Corvette is made. I was like, oh, that's good. Okay. But she said, call him. He's, he's the vocation director. And so I called, and immediately after two rings, hello, this is Father Wade Menezes, the Fathers of Mercy. Can I help you? I said, Father Wade, I don't want anything to do with you. I don't want anything to do with the community. I don't want anything to do with the priesthood. I just want to come and pray. And he said, okay, buy a flight, come on down. And so Father Wade picked me up in his 2005, brand new at that time, 2005 Nissan Titan 4x4 truck. And I got off the plane and I said, if this is the priesthood, I'm all in. (laughs) But the funny thing is, is that Father Wade started driving down I-65. And then all of a sudden we got to exit two on I-65 in Franklin, Kentucky. And we started going down State Route 73. And being a boy from California, I saw McDonald's, I saw BP Gas, I saw these different familiar sites. But then we got on State Route 73 and it started opening up. I saw tobacco fields, corn fields. I saw we were passing Mennonite buggies. We were passing barns and these things called tractors and rows of corn and these different places and silos. What is a silo? And I started getting scared because I had seen Children of, Children of the Corn one too many times to know how this movie was going to end. And so finally we get to the 46 acres of the Fathers of Mercy. Father Wade takes my bag out of the bed of the truck and he says, here's the deal. You can't look at the internet. You can't look at the newspaper. You're not going to watch TV. You're not going to watch movies. You're going to eat what's placed in front of you. And you're going to take this time as prayer. And I said, what, Father Wade? He said, if you came to pray, this is the deal. You're going to be praying. Leave the world behind. No contact outside of these next four days besides what's going on here. Focus on Christ. And I said, Father Wade, you must be insane. This is December of 2006. Uh, 2005. This is the Patriots are on a tear. This is NFL playoffs. This is hockey is in season. NBA is in season. I would watch buggy racing if you gave me a chance. But you can't take away the TV. You can't take away my phone. And he said, trust me, just pray. And I said, sure, whatever, Father Wade. So every night of those four nights at 8 p.m., because a new sports center came on, I was underneath my covers with my cell phone and my flashlight, calling my friends, seeing what the update scores were. Literally. I lied to a priest, and I was underneath the covers, like your three-year-old watching you know, his, his iPad or whatever. But I prayed. So over the four days, at the end of the four days, I said, Father Wade, thanks, but no thanks. Good luck. God bless. We'll see you in heaven. Checks in the mail for your time and effort. This place is crazy. You live, you got cows, you got horses, you live on 46 acres, you got this beautiful chapel, but no way. You got to live with a bunch of dudes for the rest of your life and travel. This is not for me. Good luck. God bless. See you later. Got on the plane. And I started praying on the plane because I wasn't going back to anything. No girlfriend, living with my parents, no money, no job, nothing. And I said, Lord, where am I going? I don't know where. I'm, uh, this, is, this is, no. I don't know what to do. You've got to do something now. This is a theme. You've got to do something now. And so as the wheels left the tarmac of Nashville International Airport, I closed my eyes and immediately I saw the two statues at my, at my home parish one of the Blessed Mother, the Immaculate uh, Heart of Mary, and um, the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Both their hands are out like this, in open. And, they're say- and I heard audibly in my mind, where are you going? We're here. We're here. And my heart sunk. And so I made a pact at 30,000 feet that if God got me in by March... I gave him three months to get me into the religious community. If he gets me in by March, I will go this year. But if not, I'm out of here. I'll I'll apply the next March if I feel like it. Well, guess what? I was the fastest applicant to acceptance in Fathers of Mercy history. I went through four phases of application and got my acceptance letter before March 1st. And every time those phases, all the paperwork from Hawaii, from my mom and dad, from my my baptismal records, all of my first communion and confirmation records, all of these letters of recommendation from these people, all of my biographies and everything, all four times, 
The five priests on our council that vote on applicants were home. See, what you don't know about the Fathers of Mercy is that we're on the road 30 weeks out of the year. The chance of five priests being home at the same exact time is unheard of. Right now, there is one priest at the Fathers of Mercy because we are all on missions. What are the chances that my applications all four times got there and all five priests were there to vote on my application, pass it around, pray about it, and send it back out to me after accepting it? Slim to none would be generous. My brothers and sisters, of course, that's not the end of this story. I fought my vocation for many years, especially the first two years at seminary, because I thought God had made a mistake. There's no way. Look at me. I'm just a boy from California. I'm not even smart. But God always knows what he's doing. Because the end of my story, my brothers and sisters, and the reason why I tell all of that is to give praise, honor, and glory to God through our Blessed Mother. Because when I was seven years old, my mother took me and my two younger brothers, all three boys, and she stood before the statue of our Blessed Mother Mary, and she put her head on each of our heads. I was seven, my middle brother was four, and my little brother was in my mom's arms. And she said, Blessed Mother, they are yours. If you want one, if you want two, if you want all three, they are yours. Take them as you want them for your service. Whatever that may be, whatever the vocation, they are yours. And my brothers and sisters, during my vacation of my diaconate ordination, I got to go home and spend some time with family. And one of the nights I was home, my mom and dad walked up to me. And both of them were crying hysterically. And I thought somebody had died. I was wondering. My mom said, we need to tell you something. And I said, okay. I turned off the TV and I I gave them my full attention. They said, you know mom and dad lived together before you were born. I said, yeah. I said, okay, you got married. Great. No problem. I said, I already knew that. Why are you telling me that? I said, well, we got pregnant. We got pregnant, but we weren't in the financial state of mind. We weren't, we were young. We were, we, we were worried about money. We were doing, we couldn't have a child. And so your dad and I had an abortion and my heart sunk because for 30 years, my mom and dad hadn't told me this. I said, my mom, I said, mom, why are you telling me now? She said, do you remember when I took you in front of the blessed mother? And I said, yeah, vaguely. She said, I did that. I did that because I had gone on a retreat and I had realized that I needed healing. I needed healing from my abortion. And so the pastor, Father Garcia, had told me, take your children before the Blessed Mother and consecrate them to her. Because you took a life, now give their lives to the Blessed Mother so that they may be offerings of love from your heart to to Christ's heart through her heart. And everything made sense to me, my brothers and sisters, because my mother said to me, she said, from that moment, I knew that you were special. Not special as in some kind of genius or something, but she, she saw me as different from the other two boys. She said, from that moment on, I knew that God was calling you to something special. And when you said yes to the Fathers of Mercy, I knew that God was calling you to something different. And she said, it is only now. I'm telling you this now. Your dad and I are speaking to you now because we truly know that God has brought a greater good, that you will become a priest and you will go out into the world preaching the good news of Christ and you will be an example of God's mercy for all mankind because I took a life, my mom speaking, I took a life, God has taken your life and will touch people with the mercy of God. My brothers and sisters, I'm nothing special. Like I said, worthless conduit, your garbage can, whatever you want to call me, I'm a priest of God, therefore I'm in the service of God. But this is truly the priesthood. The priesthood is not glamorous. You see that on TV. You see that in your daily life. It's hard to be a priest. But by God, by God's grace, there go I. 
And I have never been so joyful, never had so much peace, never been so enamored by the fire of God's love than the day that I said, yes, Lord, I will be your priest because you have called me. I fought it, my brothers and sisters. But when I said, Lord, your will be done, like our blessed mother, just like Father Hardesty did, just like so many priests before, Father Chris, all of the priests that you have known, they stood before God and said, yes, Lord, may it be done unto me according to your word. We are God's instruments. And my brothers and sisters, how beautiful it is that each one of us, each one of us has an earthly mother and a heavenly mother who directs our lives and gives us a good swift, and swift kick in the butt when we need it. <coughs> because my brothers and sisters, I never would have chose this life. But thank God I did. Thank God that he chose me. Because I've never been so happy in my life. But the lesson, my brothers and sisters, and why I tell you all of this, not to give praise, honor, and glory to me or my mom or my dad or anybody, not even the fathers of mercy. We're a bunch of bums for Christ. But the point is, is that each one of us needs to say those words of our blessed mother. Each one of us needs to wake up each and every day saying, Lord, not my will be done, but yours today. Direct me through the hands of our blessed mother, Mary. Lord, may it be done unto me according to your word. And Lord, all I have is right now. The past is gone. The future is unseen. All I have is now. And I want to give you praise, honor, and glory right here, right now. And we've talked about conversion, my brothers and sisters. But how do we change our lives? How do we grow in holiness each and every day? Make an intention each day. And not only that, make an intention for everything that you think, say, and do. See, when you come to Mass, we'll talk about it tomorrow. There's an intention. Father Hardesty and I say, today it is for, you know, Rose Smith who died for the repose of her soul. We make an intention when we come to Mass, but you can do the same thing each and every day. When you come to Mass, when you're going out into, your work, into work, to school, whatever it might be, Father Hardesty and I, when we put on the vestments for Mass, there is a prayer attached to every single garment that we put on. Why can't you do the same thing? When you put on your glasses in the morning, Lord, let me see you in other people. Lord, let me, as I tie my shoes, let me walk where you want me to walk. When it's cold outside, you put a coat on. Lord, clothe me with your mantle. Lord, I want to love you. Lord, keep me warm inside and out. Let the fire of love burn in my heart for you alone and those that I meet. Lord, as I do my hair, my nails, as I put on my makeup, may I be beautiful in your eyes first so that I may be beautiful to those whom I encounter. Everything. There is nothing, nothing. Taking a shower. Lord, please cleanse me of all of my sins. Have mercy on me. Let, I, let me be clean in your blood and water, in your love for me. No matter what you say, washing your hands can be a prayer. Brushing your teeth. Cleanse my mouth so that I don't scream and yell at my kids today. Lord, help me. Whatever it is, whatever that day need, that the need for that day, pray for it. Constantly. Brush your teeth 12 times a day if you have to so that you don't blaspheme the name of God. So that every single moment, my brothers and sisters, when you do that, when you intentionize and live the present moment with Jesus Christ, that is that many more times you're remembering Jesus in that day. And God's grace is coming down each and every time you call upon His name. How amazing and how transformative that is. Because we see in the Gospels, people cry out to Jesus. The blind see, the deaf hear, the mute speak, the lame jump up for joy just because they cried out, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus, have mercy on me. Lord, let me just touch the tassel of your cloak. Whatever it might be, my brothers and sisters. And so I ask you, with the words of Pope Benedict XVI, Friends, again I ask you, what about today? What are you seeking and what is God whispering to you? 
The hope which never disappoints is Jesus Christ, and it is from within the church that you too will find the courage and support to walk the way of the Lord. Nourished by personal prayer, prompted in silence, and shaped by the church's liturgy, you will discover the particular vocation God has for you. Embrace it with joy. My brothers and sisters, you are on the front lines of our church. You are in the places where Father Hardesty and I cannot go with your family, friends, your workplace, in the grocery store, in the women's bathroom even. You are a light to this world. You are the salt of the earth and you radiate Christ in all that you think, say, and do. So it's high time we start getting rid of the things in our life that are putting obstacles up. Like we talked about, come to confession, receive the healing, pray in the name of Jesus that God will heal you of mind, body, and soul. And unite yourself to him in all that you think, say, and do by making that intention. So we go forth tonight, my brothers and sisters, because tomorrow we end our mission. Tomorrow we end bringing it all back to Jesus and the most holy Eucharist and the holy sacrifice of the Mass, where we are called to be witnesses of the Eucharistic love, the self-sacrifice love Jesus has for us. Tomorrow we conclude our mission with the source and summit of our faith, But how did Jesus come to us in this Christmas mystery? We remember that he chose a humble virgin. He came through our blessed mother Mary, whom he gave to us on the cross to be our mother now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you. Jesus said to his disciples, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. Everyone who listens to these words of mine and acts on them will be like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and buffeted the house, but it did not collapse. It had been set solidly on rock. And everyone who listens to these words of mine, but does not act on them, will be like a fool who built his house on sand. The rain fell, the floods came, and the winds blew and buffeted the house, and it collapsed and was completely ruined. The Gospel of the Lord. Well, welcome, my brothers and sisters, to the last night of our parish mission. And it's been an honor to to spend this week with you and to meditate upon God's holy mysteries. And we've talked about a lot, of course. As you remember, we've talked about how we are all made in the image and likeness of God. The fact that Christ came, suffered, and died for love of us, but he did not leave us orphans. He said, I will be with you until the end of the age. And we talked about the Holy Catholic Church, the fact that how do we know that Christ founded that church, this church, the church that we profess each and every Sunday as one holy Catholic and apostolic. Then we talked about our response, conversion, and taking advantage of God's mercy, that God's mercy and love endure forever. There is no end, enduring forever, and that no matter how many times we are weak and sin, God is always waiting for us in the confessional to get that fresh start, that new beginning, and to be washed clean of all of our sins. And then last night we talked about our holy Catholic faith, the fact that we profess love for our Blessed Mother and that we could not love her more than Jesus loved her. He was the one who stayed with her for 30 years, spending time with her. And when we pray the rosary and when we pray, We meditate upon the mysteries of Christ through the eyes of Mary, through the eyes of his mother and our mother. And today we bring it all back to Jesus and what an appropriate gospel we have for today. The fact that Jesus tells us he who is wise builds upon the rock. He builds his house upon the rock, not on the sand. If you've ever tried to stand on sand in the midst of an ocean when the waves are crashing in, You can't stand. You start sinking, right? The sand is taken out from underneath your feet by that rushing water. It keeps digging deeper and deeper. And if you stand there for a couple minutes, you'll be down to your ankles. A couple hours, down to your your knees. 
And soon, you might dig a hole for yourself and fall down. But when you stand upon a rock, it is a sure foundation. And that's what we want to meditate upon tonight. The most holy Eucharist. The greatest of all gifts that God gave to us himself. But my brothers and sisters, I think sometimes we come with a different attitude to Holy Mass. To come and see Jesus in adoration. Or even to pop by in the midst of the day. To just say hi to Jesus. We come with some sort of quote-unquote obligation. But my brothers and sisters, I have a story for you. There once was a family. There was a family and the mother was teaching their three-year-old son about the sanctuary lamp, that little red candle that signifies Jesus is truly present in the tabernacle. That Jesus in every church, every Catholic church, Jesus is there in the golden box, that golden tabernacle. And that red light, that red candle, signifies Jesus is truly there. And there is only one time throughout the year that that candle is not lit, which is on Good Friday when Jesus died, going into Holy Saturday. But then it is lit again on Holy Saturday night at the Easter Vigil, right? So the mother was teaching their three-year-old son, Johnny, all about this tabernacle light, the red candle, And so right before they came in for Sunday Mass, that following Sunday, she looked at Johnny and said, remember, Jesus is present there. So we want to be very reverent in church. We want to genuflect. We want to stand. We want to be quiet and listen to God's words. But know that Jesus is there because that red candle says Jesus is always there. And so Johnny said, fine, Mom. And he walked in. He genuflected. He sat down in the pew and he was good. He was good. And then all of a sudden, at the homily, he sat down and he put his hands underneath his chin and he looked intently at that red candle. He stared at it continually. And his mom and dad noticed this. They didn't think anything of it in the beginning. But then after about five minutes, father was continuing to preach and preach and preach. And Johnny got, got down on his, on his elbows, on his knees, and he was looking at the candle really, really intently. And finally, the dad looked at the mother and said, ask him what he's doing. What is he doing? And so the mom bent down and said, Johnny, what are you looking at? Why are you looking at the red candle, the tabernacle candle so intently? And Johnny took his gaze off of that candle for just one second, just to look up to his mom and say, I'm waiting for it to turn green so we can go. It's funny, my brothers and sisters, but isn't this the attitude we come to Mass with? Aren't we little Johnnies and little Jennies looking intently on that red candle, hoping that it turns green, or hoping that Father will say those blessed words, the most glorious words ever said by any human being, go in peace, the Mass is ended, so that you can get on with your life? Because I got things to do, Father, seriously. I mean, you you don't know. I mean... (laughs) I mean, there's a football game at one and you're going to say you're going to bring in this priest who's going to preach at the 11 o'clock mass. Don't you know I got to pick up a couple pizzas, some beer. I got to get back, man. I've got to get there for the pregame show. Father, how could you do this? Or father, don't you know my kids are coming over? Don't you know that I've got a plan and I've got to prep and I've got to clean the house and get all things ready and I've got to get everything prepared for them to come over at six o'clock tonight? How dare you speak? How dare you speak for 10 minutes in the homily at the 8 o'clock Mass? Don't you know I have things to do? My brothers and sisters, this is not how we should come to Mass. Because the devil takes that and he runs with it. As we've talked about this week, he's looking for any little crack in your armor to get to you, poke and prod at you, to make you distracted from what is really going on here, on this altar in the midst of Holy Trinity Parish or Holy Rosary Parish. How beautiful what is going on here. And that's why the devil wants to keep you distracted as much as he can. But then, my brothers and sisters, we teach our children that there's this obligation to come to Mass. Yes, there's a commandment. It says, keep holy the Sabbath. But I don't remember God saying to Moses, there's an obligation 
But if you want to use that word, and I grant that we use that word, but use it in the right context. Don't use it as some binding force or handcuffs for your kids. Think of obligation in this way. When you woke up this morning, you, sound, you heard a sound in your stomach. It went <laughs> You were hungry. You were hungry. And I bet, I'm just taking a shot in the dark. The first thing that came to your mind when you heard that sound, when you felt that feeling of hunger, you looked up in God and you said, How dare you, God? How dare you oblige me to eat this morning? How dare you bind me to eat this morning? And then you tell me I have to drink coffee. I have to go to Hardee's and get a great bacon, bacon, egg, and cheese sandwich. I've got to go down to the quick stuff. How dare you oblige me to eat this morning and oblige me to drink? How dare you? And you're telling me three hours later at lunchtime, you're going to oblige me to eat again. Then six hours later at dinner, I'm obliged again? You've got to be kidding me. You are out of your mind, God, to oblige me. And you probably woke up this morning as I did. And I woke up and I did one of these. <gasps> Wait, I got to breathe too? You're going to oblige me to breathe? No, my brothers and sisters. It's silly. You're laughing because those are ludicrous thoughts, right? Obligations to eat and to drink and to breathe. You don't even think about it. In fact, you look forward to it. But yet, those are all gifts from God. There are some people who cannot eat, who have perpetual thirst. Their thirst cannot be quenched because of some disease or something. And there are people who can't breathe. They long to take one deep breath of oxygen. It's a gift, my brothers and sisters. It's a gift that God has given to us. And without those three, quote unquote, obligations, you would die. So it is with this obligation, this obligation, Jesus tells us, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has life within him. Me and my father, we will come and abide with him. We will commune with him. That's where we get the communion, holy communion, because God himself is coming to dwell in our hearts. So we ask the question, what is the mass? It is the one supreme eternal act of worship of God. It is the mystical renewal of the sacrifice of Calvary. We, like St. John and our Blessed Mother, are at the foot of the cross beholding God suffering and dying for us. And all the graces and blessings at that moment of Calvary, when Jesus died for us, come to us at this Mass and are poured forth into our hearts. That help that we need, divine help, comes to us in whatever our need. That's why we stressed last night, come with an intention to Mass. Sometimes our, our young people, and, and I was one of them, I went to Mass and I said, I don't get anything out of the Mass. Nothing, it's not entertaining. I don't get anything out of it. But one time a priest told me, well, what are you putting into Mass? You come in listening to Metallica and you come in hanging out with your friends outside talking about the hot girl that walked in right in front of you. And you come in at Mass and you say, well, I'm distracted. Well, yeah, what you doing outside? What are you doing in the vestibule? What are you looking at everybody else in the pews for? You're distracted because we don't come with an intention. If we said, you know what, today I heard Johnny is sick in the hospital. Today when I go to Mass, I am going to go to Mass for the intention of Johnny, that he may be healed. Or for my son, who is 3,000 miles away and needs my prayers right now because he's no longer Catholic. Or for my grandchildren, for my spouse. For Father Hardesty or Father Andy, who are poor sinners that God has looked upon with love. Anybody and everybody, any situation, any circumstance, you can bring it to this Mass. And when you are distracted, renew the intention. All right, Lord, I'm sorry. 
I got distracted. That girl is half naked in the front pew and I don't know what to do about it. But Lord, I came here for, to pray for Johnny and I'm here to talk to, about Johnny. I want to give you praise, honor, and glory. Lord, help me to stay focused on you for Johnny, for my spouse. I'm sorry, Lord, I'm distracted. I'm thinking about the grocery list that I'm going to have to go to Kroger after Mass to pick out for my kids. I'm sorry, Lord, but I came to pray for my son, for my daughter. I came to pray for healing, Lord. You renew that intention, right? Just like when you lose your keys or when you forget what you were going to the kitchen for, what do you do? You renew the intention. What am I doing here? Why am I coming into the kitchen? Where did I leave my keys? You renew the intention. What is the intent of the action you're doing? Well, what in the heck are you doing here? If you didn't bring an intention to this Mass, think of one. Take the time at the prayers of the faithful to say, you know what, today I want to give it up. I want to lift up on that patent, on that, in that chalice. I want to lift up Johnny or Jimmy or Jenny or Sam. Whoever it might be, lift them up. When Father says, lift up your hearts, that's what we're doing. Pray, brethren, that my sacrifice, us, the priests, my sacrifice and yours. You made a sacrifice to be here. Who are you bringing to the sacrifice? Jesus had his mom and St. John there. Who are you bringing? Who are you praying for today? This is what, how we can put into the Mass and see the immense and infinite graces that God wants to pour forth for us. So when we come to Mass, we've got to see that. See when Father lifts up that sacred host. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. You are blessed. You are blessed. And when you are blessed, that means that God's grace is dwelling in you. That's why we always remember when we come for Holy Communion, when we come up, that means that we're in the state of grace. We are not conscious of any mortal sins. And we've got to get away from the fact that we stigmatize people who don't come up for communion. If anything, they probably just forgot they had chewed gum in the back of church. They spit it out and they can't come to communion because they didn't fast. Or they slammed that, that um, coffee right before they came in because they forgot that they weren't supposed to drink the coffee, but it was sitting in the cup holder in the car, so they just drank it real quick. Why are you thinking that they sinned? No. If you have mortal sin on your soul, sit in the pew. If you haven't kept the fast, sit in the pew. There is nothing wrong with that. There is nothing wrong with that. Our attendance at, so at Holy Mass is what fulfills keep holy the Sabbath day. It's okay. Make a spiritual communion. That's why the church tells us that it is only required to receive communion once a year. However, the church invites us to come to communion as much as we can because we keep getting grace. We keep getting God's help in the midst of our difficulties and our trials. But the only requirement is one time a year at Easter time. So my brothers and sisters, don't judge people if they sit in the pew. We don't know what their motives are. But we know that they love God enough that they say, you know what, I'm not worthy or I haven't kept the commandment of God. Therefore, I sit here and I make a spiritual communion. That's why St. Paul took it in 1 Corinthians so strictly. He said, this is a serious obligation to come and receive Jesus. That's a serious act. And he who eats and drinks of the body and blood of Christ unworthily, eat and drinks condemnation on themselves. It's like throwing dung on top of mud. Because if we're not worthy to come up and receive him, which we never are, but if we're conscious of mortal sin, if we come up, then we're just aggravating the sin. We're adding to it. But my brothers and sisters, the beautiful hope that we have is that we don't have to persist in that very long. Confession is always there, and then we can run up to communion. We can receive Jesus with that beautiful, blameless, pure heart, saying, Lord, I am not worthy, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. My brothers and sisters, when Jesus Christ himself 
took bread at that last supper and he said, take this, all of you, and eat of it. This is my body. This is my blood. Those were the words of God. And just like on the moment of creation, when God breathed on the earth, he formed man in his image and likeness and breathed life into him. And when Jesus in the Holy Gospels said, take courage, your faith has saved you. Be healed. The crippled leap up for joy. The blind see, the deaf hear, the mute speak. Those who had withered hands, they could stretch their hand out at the word of God. A woman 30 years hemorrhaging, bleeding for 30 years at the words of Jesus, that hemorrhage dried up. So we see the power of the word of God. Why do we restrict and say, well, when Jesus said, take this all of you, he was only speaking symbolically. No, 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 no. Wait a second, Father. I mean, you're you're really going to tell me that that's Jesus up there? I mean, seriously, look at that. I mean, that that bread is flat. It's not even good bread. Like Sara Lee, they got some good bread. That, that's weak. That's small, flat, tasteless. This is terrible. It's not even leavened. It's not going to rise. And that wine. Oh my gosh. I've I've had better wine at the restaurant down the street. But my brothers and sisters, remember, God's ways are so far above our ways. Yeah, maybe you would have chose something different. But this is the way God comes to us. in In humility. Under the humble appearance of bread. We're not worthy to receive it, of course. But my brothers and sisters, when those words of Jesus are said, there is power here. And maybe our Protestant brothers and sisters and even our Catholic brothers and sisters have told us, no, 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 this is only symbolic. Well, I beg to differ, my brothers and sisters, because there are points in the Gospels where Jesus speaks symbolically. And I want to tell you about them. In John chapter 4, Jesus had just met the Samaritan woman. And his disciples come back to him. They weren't there when he met with that Samaritan woman. They came back and they said, Rabbi, eat. And he said, I have food of which you do not know. And so the disciples talked amongst themselves and they said, wait a second. Has anyone brought him any food? And Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. So Jesus speaks symbolically, then clarifies his statements. And then in Matthew 16, it says the disciples reached the other side of the sea. They had forgotten to bring bread. But Jesus said to them, take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And then the disciples discussed it among themselves, saying, we brought no bread. But Jesus, aware of this, he said, O men of little faith, why do you discuss among yourselves the fact that you have no bread? Do you not perceive? Do you not remember the five loaves of the 5,000 and how many baskets you gathered? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And then St. Matthew records, Then the disciples understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. This is clear. Jesus rebukes his disciples for misunderstanding. And then he clarifies his statements so that they do understand. But my brothers and sisters, what about John chapter 6? Have you read it lately? Do you see how many times Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Unlike the bread of your ancestors, this bread, the bread that I give, is my flesh for the life of the world. My flesh is true bread. My blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has life within them. You want a question to ask your brothers and sisters, your Protestant brothers and sisters, and your Catholic brothers and sisters? When they ask you, were you born again? Of course I was born again. At my baptism, I was consecrated to God. At my confirmation, I received the Holy Spirit. And I said, yes, Lord, I am ready to be your soldier. Yes, Lord, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. But my brothers and sisters, do you have life within you? Because in John chapter 6, Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have any life within you. 
Do you have life within you? Do you eat of his flesh? Do you drink of his blood? If not, zero life, right? This is clear, my brothers and sisters. But Jesus insists over and over and over again. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. My brothers and sisters, we only have to look at the fact that the disciples, the disciples who had walked with Jesus for these three years, at this moment, at John chapter 6, they walked away because of this quote-unquote hard teaching. What did Jesus do? When they walked away, when they were turning around and walking away, in John chapter 6, 66, he didn't go, wait a second, no, 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 whoa, 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 wait a second, hold your horses. No, 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 I'm only speaking symbolically. This isn't one that you got to walk away from. No, 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 no. See, what I want you to do is just think about me. Maybe once a year, maybe twice a month. Just think about me. Remember me. You know, and and take some Welch's grape juice in little Dixie cups and take some bread, a sourdough loaf maybe, and just break it amongst yourselves and just remember me. No, 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 no. See, you don't understand. See, you thought I was talking literally. No, 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 no. See, I was only talking symbolically. No, Jesus lets them walk away. These disciples who had walked with him for a long time and then to add insult to injury, he walks over to the 12 apostles and he says, are you going to leave too? That's an ultimatum. Are you going to leave too? This is it. I'm standing here. I said it over and over. I am the bread of life. This is my flesh. This is my blood. You eat it. You have life. You're going to walk away too. And Peter speaks up for all of the apostles and he says, Lord, who are we going to go to? Who are we? You, You have the words of everlasting life. I'm rolling with you, Lord. You said I have to eat your flesh and blood. I don't know how this is going to happen, but give me that flesh. Give me that blood. I want life, Lord. You have the words of eternal life. I'm rolling with you. Let's go. Come on. It's beautiful, my brothers and sisters, because that is the act of faith. That is faith that we talked about the first night. No arguments, no excuses, but a loving presence that Jesus is with us truly. And when we have difficulty, my brothers and sisters, When we look upon this bread and wine that has been turned into the body and blood of Christ, maybe we have doubts. Maybe we wonder, is that truly you, Lord? And there's a story that I want to tell you. It's about an officer in the king's king's army. He was walking to a gathering, a conference of all the other officers in the king's army. And he was walking. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the town, in the town square, He saw a priest with an altar boy walking, bringing communion to the sick. And so this officer in the king's army, he knelt down right where he stood. But he didn't realize he knelt right into a puddle and sullied his good uniform, his dress blues. He had gotten dirty. And so when he got back up, he saw a little boy look at him and run. And the little boy ran to the king's officers and told them all about this situation that this king's officer had knelt down in the middle of the street before this priest. And so when the officer got to the other officers, he was ridiculed. He was made fun of. How dare you? Don't you know you're an officer of the king? How dare you kneel down before this priest? There is no way. Don't you know you have duty? You have honor. You have respect. You should respect yourself and respect your uniform more and respect the king more than to just kneel down in the street. And so the officer looked at his buddies and he said, my brothers, right now, if the king walked in the back door in Bermuda shorts and a t-shirt, what would you do? And one of the newly enlisted officers piped up and he screamed, I would kneel down right here, right where I stand, because the king is the king no matter what clothes he has on. And the officer said, so it is with my Lord who came to me under the appearance of bread. Am I going to not kneel down, not give him homage out of fear of ridicule from you? My brothers and sisters, yes, maybe our eyes deceive us, but your eyes deceive you all the time. Today, when you were drinking that nice fresh Coca-Cola and you put ice into your drink, 
What was that? Water. Water deceived your eyes today. How about when you were having your tea? That water evaporated and turned to steam. Your eyes deceived you. That was water. That was water. And then that flowing river that goes by, again, water. Your eyes deceive you. It's water. How can it be liquid, but yet solid, but yet be a gas at the same time? I am deceived. How dare you, God? No. You believe, even though you've been deceived. My brothers and sisters, we still believe because that is the act of faith. That is the act of faith that we put into God who tells us, this is my body, this is my blood. And St. Cyril of Jerusalem in 350 AD, one of the early church fathers, he said, when Jesus himself, therefore, having declared and said of the bread, this is my body, who will dare any longer to doubt? And when Jesus himself has affirmed and said, this is my blood, who can ever hesitate and say it is not his blood? Do not, therefore, regard the bread and wine as simply that, for they are, according to the Master's declaration, the body and blood of Christ. Even though the senses suggest to you the otherwise, let faith make you firm. Do not judge in this matter by taste, but be fully assured, not doubting, that you have been deemed worthy to receive the body and blood of Christ. My brothers and sisters, as the Council of Trent in the 16th, 16th century, fighting against um, the uh, propaganda of the Protestant Reformation, the false teachings that they were teaching about the Catholic Church, the, cate- the Catechism of the Council of Trent affirmed and said that Christ is not present because we believe, but that we believe because He is already present and He is not absent Because we do not believe, but that he remains with us so that we can live in communion with him. Jesus said and promised to us his last words, like we talked about. I will remain with you even until the end of the age. And that's why he comes to us in holy communion. And God reveals himself without conditions under the appearance of bread and wine. There are all powerful. God makes himself so small, so poor under the appearance of this bread and wine. But we never doubt, my brothers and sisters, that it's truly God in that manger at Christmas, right? But this all-powerful God came to us as a baby, a crying baby. We never doubt that. Let us put our faith in the Holy Eucharist, that Christ is waiting for us in adoration, in the Holy Tabernacle, at each and every Mass, So whether we believe it or not, whether we realize it or not, God is truly present here before us. God is here with us and remains with us. And that's why Pope Benedict XVI, in 2005, he said, For lay people too, Eucharistic spirituality must be their interior motor for all of their activities. There is no dichotomy that is acceptable between faith and life in their mission of spreading the spirit of Christianity in the world. Nothing should stop you from uniting spirit and life together. Your belief in the Eucharist that you take out, take him out to those whom you encounter. My brothers and sisters, we believe truly every single week when we hear those beautiful miracles of Jesus in the Holy Gospels, that the lame leaped up for joy, the blind saw, the deaf heard, the mute speak? Why can we not believe that God is going to do miracles in our lives when we receive Him? The angels are jealous of us because we can receive God. They only adore God. We actually take Him into our hearts and truly, truly and substantially, He comes into our hearts and therefore we ourselves can say, He has become part of me. My blood is with the blood of Jesus. My flesh is with the flesh of Jesus. And as St. Augustine said, the bread that you eat here at the holy sacrifice of the Mass is not like the bread of this world. The bread of this world and the chili I ate for dinner tonight, that will become Andiness. That will become part of Andy. But when you receive the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus, you become more Christ-like. Because you receive him and he transforms you to reflect him more and more. 
So my brothers and sisters, as I told you on the first night and the second night and the third night and the fourth night, Jesus promises us, I will be with you until the end of the age. And he gives us the mandate to go out, go into this world and preach the good news. Go out and take me, my love, my peace, my joy, my mercy to those whom you encounter. You are blessed for having come to the supper of the Lamb. And he tells us another declaration, another mandate. Take this. It's an imperative. You take this, all of you, and eat of it, drink of it. This is my body. This is my blood. My brothers and sisters, on our journey to sainthood, it's difficult. There's obstacles. We fight. We continue to struggle in this life. And it is a journey, no doubt. But you always need food for the journey, right? If you're going to take a trip, you're going to take food. So we need food on our journey, my brothers and sisters. So we come to the altar of God and say, Yes, Lord, I have been baptized. Lord, I am your child. I am your son, your daughter. I have been washed clean in the sacrament of confession. I have taken advantage of your blood and water poured forth for me on the cross, washed my garments clean. I am pure, Lord, and I have your grace reigning in my heart. And now, Lord, I want to receive you. I want you to be part of me. I have been washed clean and I want eternal life. I want to live forever with you and I want you to remain in me and I in you. And that's when the priest comes down from this altar, down these three steps. And he says to you, the body of Christ. This is the body of Christ. The body of Christ. And what do you respond? Amen. I believe. Yes, Lord, I believe. I believe that you want to transform my life. I believe that you are all powerful. I believe that you are always listening to my prayers. I believe that you want to be with me. And you want me to be with you in heaven one day. So, Lord, I come to your altar. Lord, I give you thanks, honor, and praise. Lord God, you are my refuge and my strength. Lord, you are the rock that I build my house, my family, my life on. Amen, Lord. I truly believe. I thank you all for coming to our parish mission. And I thank you for coming and giving God praise, honor, and glory tonight on your journey to heaven. Because... God loves us so much, my brothers and sisters, that he gives himself, and as he said, no greater love than this, to lay down one's life for his friends. May God bless you, and thank you again for coming, and may God be praised now and forever. Amen.